Happy New Year, uh, if it's not too late to say so, and welcome to the January um, edition of the Lift Off webinar series brought to you by Lift and the Michigan Manufacturing Technology Center. Um, a few, my name is Joe Steele, Communications Director here at Lift. Um, a few housekeeping issues um, I'd like to go through uh, before we get started. First of all, if you can put your phone on mute, that'd be helpful as we are uh, recording this, as mentioned. These uh, webinars are all posted on our uh, Lyft website at uh, lyft.technology slash liftoff. Um, if you do have questions during the, uh, the webinar, please use the chat function that is in the uh, GoToMeeting um, taskbar. You can address those uh, questions to the organizer, uh, which is myself, and I will help facilitate the Q&A uh, after the after this session uh, has concluded today with uh, with Flash Bay Knight and uh, and Gary Cola. Um, I mentioned already, uh, each liftoff webinar is recorded, posted on our website, so please uh, feel free to link back to it, uh, uh, visit uh, this webinar if you missed something, uh, if you'd like to catch up on something you thought you heard or wanted to review something. You can also go back and check out some of the sessions that we have held previously. Uh, we've held these each month since uh, August, uh, with the exception of, of December, um, and uh, and we look forward to to your feedback on them, and, and hopefully you get to go back and uh, and visit going forward. Um, a few uh, comments about Lyft really quickly, in case folks uh, are unaware. Uh, we are lightweight innovations for tomorrow. We are one of 14 national uh, advanced manufacturing institutes known as Manufacturing USA. Um, each of the 14 institutes have different technologies that they focus on in terms of research and development um, and uh, workforce education. Our mission here at Lyft in Detroit is to accelerate the development and application of innovative lightweight metal production and manufacturing technologies to benefit both the US commercial and defense markets. We do that in three different ways. Um, we do that through technology development, uh, the R&D work that is taking place uh, with our member institutions. You'll hear uh, you'll hear that a little bit more about that from uh, from Gary and Flash Bayonet, longtime Lyft members. Um, we also help support transitioning that uh, technology into the marketplace. Uh, if uh, technology is developed and it's just put on the shelf uh, to gather dust, then it's we're really we're really not accomplishing our goal of helping advance manufacturing in this country. So we help uh, find ways to transition um, that new technology into the marketplace. Equally, if uh, we don't have the workforce that is trained and, and has the right skills and abilities to use uh, those uh, new technologies that are being developed, um, it doesn't do us any good either. So uh, one, of our, uh, one of our tasks is to better prepare um, an educated workforce uh, to, to be ready to take on uh, those new uh, those new uh, technologies. Uh, you can learn more at our website at lift.technology. You can follow us on Twitter at News from Lift, um, or you can give us a call uh, here in in Detroit. We'd be happy to uh, uh, to answer any questions you have, or or uh, uh, or you know uh, fill you in with any more uh, more information that you might need. Uh, as mentioned, we are here in Detroit. We are co-located with another institute. Um, the uh, IACME, the Institute uh, for Advanced Composites Manufacturing Innovation. We work in metals, they work in composites. Uh, they're headquartered down in Tennessee, but they have a automotive scale-up facility here in Detroit with us, and we just cut the ribbon on our facility uh, in October, um, highlighting uh, a number of uh, pieces of equipment we combined, put in uh, what equals in value about $50 million worth of equipment and infrastructure upgrades to our facility here in Detroit. You can see some of the pieces of equipment uh, on your screen now. Um, we're very proud of this uh, of this facility. And uh, and again, we uh, kind of have an open door policy. We're happy to uh, to have you come visit. If you're in the Detroit area, please give us a call and, and come uh, come check us out. We'd be happy to show you uh, to show you uh, show you around. Um, as I mentioned, uh, these webinars are brought to you by uh, both Lyft and the Michigan Manufacturing Technology Center, and I believe we have Edie Wiarda on uh, on the line to talk a little bit about MMTC and their work here in Michigan. Thank you, Joe, and hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Edith Wiarda with the Michigan Manufacturing Technology Center. We are the co-host or co-sponsor of this uh, webinar series. Uh, 
Our organization is the Michigan location for the nationwide manufacturing extension partnership. Uh, we are uh, a, a federally funded program uh, run under the auspices of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And there's one of us in every state in Puerto Rico. We uh, offer a variety of services focusing on assistance to small and mid-sized manufacturers. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see the portfolio of our services across the bottom. Uh, certainly uh, uh, services related to operational performance uh, improvements. Uh, that includes uh, uh, new addition cybersecurity services uh, in uh, conjunction with the uh, DOD requirements of its supply chain and soon to be expected other supply chains uh, having new requirements with regard to cybersecurity. And uh, we also do uh, services with regard to uh, growth and marketing and market research assistance. Uh, so we're, we're very excited to have uh, Gary and Flash Bay Knight uh, presenting today, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Edie. Yeah, please do check out uh, the center. They are very helpful to uh, manufacturers uh, around the state, particularly um, startups and, and small and medium uh, size enterprises. We have worked together on a number of uh, collaborations that we're very excited about. Uh, so please do check them out. And particularly, we are, as a Department of Defense sponsored institute, uh, they have been helpful in uh, in helping us uh, meet some of those uh, some of those DoD uh, requirements as well. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to pass uh, the presentation over to Gary Cola of Flash Bay Knight. So give us a second while we make that uh, while we make that change. Um, and Gary should have the presentation rights and and uh, kick us off uh, with this presentation now. So I will hand it off to Gary. Take it away, sir. Okay, well, thank you very much, Joe. Um, first question: Can everyone hear me? I can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Thank We're you, unmuted. Joe. Mute so I can hear you. Everybody, for everybody. <laughs> okay, this is a good thing. Okay, well, uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity to to talk today at uh, this event. Um, as Joe mentioned, we're here to discuss flash bayonite, and what we have actually is a, an ultra-hard armor technology that has been uh, used to develop cold stampable 1,500 to 1,800 megapascal automotive parts, um, and these are for automotive structure and energy absorbing, and they're bending to quite tight radiuses, almost folding like a sheet of paper. Uh, I always like to start out with our primary benefactor, the U.S. Department of Energy. They've been gracious enough to give us five grants in the last three years, and uh, we're working forward with that. Uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, UTK Knoxville, also Ohio State University, and previously NSF had uh, worked with us quite a bit. Um, further acknowledgments, uh, Hyundai Kia has graciously allowed us to share some of their uh, data as part of this presentation. Um, I guess starting out really quickly, uh, what is the auto industry's greatest pain? Well, right now, uh, or actually it's a few months ago when I calculated it, for each mile per gallon, it looks like that every time a vehicle misses CAFE, the cost to the OEM could be about $140. If you consider 18 million vehicles missing a single mile per gallon, this could cost the auto industry about two and a half billion dollars. Now, I know CAFE standards are always under consideration, but if they go up by about 10 miles per gallon in, by 2025, the cost of doing little, you know, doing little or nothing more is about 10 to 20 billion dollars per year. And, and that's kind of an unacceptable cost penalty that would probably be passed on to the consumer. So as you can imagine, the auto industry is quite competitive to try and make vehicles lighter, as we all know. Well, we've talked about aluminum and magnesium and titanium and carbon fiber. I, I was just at the, the North American International Auto Show yesterday, and there's, there, there's lots of exciting technologies, but one difficulty is the billions of dollars it requires to, to, to implement these high capex and uh, labor-retraining te labor technologies. 
you know, the auto industry alone themselves, as I mentioned, is facing many billion dollars in annual cafe penalties. And there's, there's good things to do with transmissions and drivetrains, but ultimately we need lighter vehicles, whether they're electrified or a standard ICE engine. So the U.S. Department of Energy seems to have a solution, or at least we think they do. Um, after three years of vetting, um, our company was given a phase three SBIR uh, research award. And uh, for those that don't know, SBIRs are quite common across 11 branches of the government. Uh, research has shown that about 4,000 phase ones for around $150,000 are issued every year. About 2,000 phase twos for three quarters of a million to a million dollars go out every year. But as far as we know, there's only um, one or two phase threes currently existence right now. One of them is for NASA. One of them is for the Navy. So you can imagine what those two might be doing. But as far as we know, there are absolutely none from the Department of Energy. And we were actually told uh, this is the only DOE phase three in anyone's memory that was funded by the Department of Energy themselves and, and not some other side branch. So we were quite proud to receive a, a unicorn, I guess you could say. And why did we receive this opportunity from DOE? Uh, what it comes down to is the potential of flash technology. Uh, Dr. David Forrest was our, our first and primary contact at DOE that's worked our technology up through the ranks there. And he wrote in Industrial Heating Magazine in the May 2017 issue that with widespread use of flash process steels, the U.S. automotive industry could save over 100 pounds of vehicle weight per car at reduced cost. Now, um, that's a pretty bold statement considering that usually people say, you know, how light can you afford? Here we've got an opportunity to pull out significant pounds and save money at the same time. So um, what are we doing here? It's flash processing. Well, the, the simplest way is to show a picture. So if you look on the right-hand side, we've got uh, a, char a caricature of uh, our process. We feed steel in from the top of this uh, display unit here. We roll past a couple of pinch rolls. We use induction heating to rapidly heat the steel and we water quench. So um, we're actually making 1600 megapascal advanced high strength steels. We are using off the shelf steel material handling equipment and also off the shelf steel. So that's pretty interesting that we can start with low cost, easy to produce grades like 1010 or 1020. Um, 1010 leads to 1100 megapascals. 1020 leads to 1500 megapascals. Working with 4130, we've actually achieved 1900 megapascals and some interesting armor results I'll talk about in a moment. We've actually worked with 13 chrome stainless, uh, similar results. Uh, what we do is we heat the steel in just a couple of seconds to, te to temperatures above 1832, um, often to near 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's a little bit counterintuitive uh, when most steel heat treating is done down around 15 or 1600 degrees. Uh, we water quench just a few seconds later and we have a, a novel technology and our goal is to control heterogeneous carbon migration and carbide dissolution for a mixed microstructure performance. Um, while that some people have questioned our novelty, we actually do have 12 issued patents around the world. Um, our first, second, and fourth family of patents have issued in, in various countries. So there is some staying power to this technology. It's not just your typical heat and quench that we've been doing for a very long time in industry. So um, when I talk about controlling carbon migration and carbide dissolution, this is actually a rather new concept. Um, most people, when they do steel heat treating, they think of homogenization. Um, if you can imagine steel in the melt ladle, of, of course there it's homogenized. That's how they check the chemistry to make sure that the steel is the alloy you're looking for. So if you could imagine, um, we're gonna talk about a steel today, 4130. Well, 4130 is about 0.85 chrome, 0.15 moly, 
and of course, of course, 0.3 carbon where it gets its name. But in the melt ladle, it's very homogenized. As soon as that steel solidifies, in a, in a crude sense, you could call it AISI 1000 plain carbon ferrite, as represented by three of the gray uh, boxes on the left hand side. It could also be part 1080 perlite. And then the MXC represents the chromium carbide. So again, a little bit of a crude representation, but when you buy 4130, you're actually buying ferrite, perlite, and carbides. In a typical heat treating operation, your goal would be to heat for um, many seconds or minutes to try and dissolve the carbides, level the carbon, and fully homogenize the austenite. And that's how steel heat treating has been focused for millennia now. What we did with our process is we chose a different path and we actually heat up in just a few seconds. We allow carbon migration to just start to occur. So for example, the 0.80 or 1080 perlite drops down to 0.65 carbon. The other two, other three areas might have 0 0.07, 0 0.05 or 0 0.03 carbon, for example. And as the chromium carbide sluggishly dissolves, we end up with 0.3 carbon in some regions. Now we very rapidly quench this. So this is a process where you heat up in a few seconds, you quench a few seconds later, and uh, we end up getting some results we expect in our flash bayonite process. Um, in the lower right corner, you can see martensite, 1065 plus some percentage of chromium. Uh, of course, that's a higher carbon martensite. The 1005 and the 1007, as expected, that is lath martensite. What's interesting is in the yellow box, the 1003 plus 0.3 chromium uh, actually forms bayonite. Now, we have worked with Professor Suresh Babu at various institutions that he's been with, and uh, through TEM and atom probe ion field microscopy, we've actually verified the presence of bayonite in our microstructure, even though we've quenched in water which is kind of unexpected, I guess you could say. Um, the other thing that's happened is we've taken this chemistry, run it through Edison Welding Institute's CCT calculator, and it in fact does predict that this chemistry, when cooled very, very rapidly, can make bayonite. The reason this may have been overlooked in the past is because 1003 plus 0.3 chromiums not the first alloy you'd think of as having a, a useful commercial value. So um, we state that carbon can move rapidly, but it also can be controlled. And you can do this through a, a thermal cycle, which is very easy to ingrain into a piece of mechanical equipment. Um, we do have very minimal alloying, so it reduces dislocations and limits fracturing. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we do know bayonites there. And what's also very interesting is we have found that this material is very readily weldable at room temperature. And we think one of the reasons may be is because the vast majority of the steel grains are actually very lean. First of all, because we're using lean alloys, but second of all, because over half of the microstructure is a very lean chemistry because we've trapped our, our carbon in pockets of high carbon regions and carbides. So, um, you know, one of the questions we ask is why flash bayonite can form parts that seem to be stronger than typical other steels can. And uh, we've kind of coined a term maximum strength in steel. And, and I don't really mean to, to be boastful here, but there's been some work done over the years. Um, 35 years ago, uh, Professor Emeritus Arnie Martyr over at Lehigh had theorized if you could make a microstructure a mixed microstructure of bayonite and martensite that you could actually make steel stronger than pure martensite. So about 30 years ago, Tamita and Okabayashi did some general studies and uh, they came up with the curves on the left. More interesting, just over 20 years ago, um, Young and Sir Harry Badesha at Cambridge um, did a little bit more work to, to refine the concept. And what I like to do is work with um, two of the four curves on this chart on the right. The upper two represent, the upper two curves represent the, the yield and UTS of alloy A. But if you look to um, the darkened in circles and squares, that is the yield and the UTS of alloy B. 
Now on this chart, the strength on the vertical axis is uh, megapascals, of course. And on the horizontal axis is the volume fraction of bayonite in a martensite matrix. So what that means is at 0% bayonite, 100% martensite, this particular alloy system shown by the darkened in circles and darkened in squares can have a 1700 megapascal UTS. Now, if you went the other direction to 100% bayonite, you would see that the strength drops down to 1400 megapascals. And bear in mind that these are medium carbon steels with heavy alloy concentrations, so you can controllably achieve the various volume fractions of bayonite. Now, what's really exciting here to see is that around 20 to 25% bayonite in a martensite matrix, you can actually get the steel to add another 100 megapascals of strength from the exact same alloy of steel. So that's kind of interesting. So your steel cost shouldn't go up, but how do you achieve this? So this has been known for, gosh, over 30 years that this mixture can make steel stronger. Well, 10% stronger might not sound like a lot, but 10% thinner starts to add up really, really quickly when you start talking about all the steel in a, a passenger vehicle or an armored vehicle. So um, working with uh, Professor Babu and the students down at uh, University of Tennessee, we believe we've got an explanation as to how this technology actually makes steel seven to 10 percent stronger. Um, everybody understands that uh, grain refinement will lead to higher strength in steel. And if you look at the pictures on the left, uh, the red ellipses are meant to represent some heavily cold work steel where the grains have been elongated. And as those grains elongate, they're fed through uh, a continuous annealing furnace with the goal of uh, refining the grains to two to four micron sizes, which comes with it uh, all the well-known well um, and well-understood uh, logic that goes along with grain refinement and steel heat treating. This is what continuous annealing lines are all about. What we did very counterintuitively is we actually grew our prior austenite grains up to sizes of 20 to 25 microns. But instead of quenching a homogenized austenite, what we're doing is quenching heterogeneous austenite. So if you could imagine this 20 to 25 micron grain size as it's austenite up at 1100 degrees C or near 2000, 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, as you quench that and you're cooling the steel, transformations occur at different temperatures. So from 650C down to 550C, or roughly 1200 to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, we actually form bayonite. And the bayonite is represented by the, the black triangles in our yellow grain. Well, for just, uh, and this is done in about 80 milliseconds, for maybe another 100 milliseconds, untransformed austenite remains in those yellow regions. Well, once we start hitting the, the martensite start temperatures, these nano refined regions represented by the yellow untransformed austenite then start to form martensite. So we've now got a 20 to 25 micron grain of a mixed microstructure of bayonite, which greatly refines the martensite as it's being formed which we believe is what leads to the, the seven to 10% higher strength. And while it's interesting for us to say that, we've worked with a couple major steel mills. Um, one of them in particular has a continuous annealing line simulator. We gave them a, a full sheet of flash bayonite um, raw material. Half of it was processed into flash bayonite. Half of it was left as 1020 steel. The parts that we had processed were easy to show 1500 megapascal UTS and good elongation and a 80% yield to tensile ratio, so 1200 megapascals yield. What they did is they cut up the other half of sheet that we did not process and they did their very best to try and match our strength and they could only get 1350 megapascals UTS. So it's just kind of anecdotal data, but if a major mill who knows what they're doing could not match our strength, there must be something interesting and special about the process. Okay. Now, uh, one other interesting concept that's further under investigation is the larger your grain sizes, the less grain boundary surface area per unit volume or per usage, 
Will that lead to less potential hydrogen embrittlement since hydrogen actually migrates on grain boundaries? Well, I can tell you for sure we've never seen any delayed cracking and we do have parts here that are six or seven years old and uh, shipped out display samples to well over 100 people at trade shows and nobody's ever come back and said we had delayed cracking or seen evidence of hydrogen embrittlement. So a good thing over time, I guess. Um, very simplified equipment that we have here, uh, lower capex, retrofitable into existing mills, significantly less floor space, higher margins, and actually capable of fitting into places beyond steel mills. Um, here's a picture of uh, the flash armor plate line, because as this technology starts out in defense, um, it, it's fitting that we built an armor plate line first. Um, this line right now is actually producing two foot by 10 foot pieces of armor plate. Um, we have roots in defense, obviously, but we're taking this armor technology to the automotive industry. So think about that from a marketing perspective, when you can take you know, an armor type material and use it for the B pillar to protect the children in the back seat of a minivan. It's gonna make a great commercial someday, we just aren't quite there yet. Now, um, how good is flash bayonite armor? Um, a few years ago, we were doing work with Army Research Lab, and we were making high hard 500 Grinnell armor. And what we were doing was taking 30 caliber armor piercing bullets at a, a given velocity and 20 millimeter blast fragments at uh, a specific velocity. And the Army tested and found out what 10 pounds per square foot or 10 PSF of our quarter inch flash 500 plate could stop. And then what they did is they had already had data, so we made the comparison charts to match the performance of 10 PSF of flash against armor piercing bullets. 12 PSF of titanium armor was needed, 16 PSF of high hard, and 17 PSF of aluminum. So that's an interesting concept since aluminum is supposed to be the lightweight armor and actually titanium is supposed to be higher performing than steel, yet we've got a steel that's significantly lighter. Um, after six months of the testing, the US Army wrote and published in a, a paper that's available online that the novel flash bayonite process has the potential to reduce cost and weight while enhancing mechanical performance. So we're kind of seeing a trend here where both Department of Energy and Department of Defense seem to have the same thoughts on flash bayonite. Um, we do have all of the, the specific ballistic information on this chart that shows feet per second and different things like that. But being that this is a public forum, uh, we don't push all of that out uh, just because we want to be careful how much information we share. But we will be happy to, you know, to share with uh, American citizens for public information on this, for private information on this. Um, well, basically, we're at automotive sheet metal tomorrow, but armor plate today, as I mentioned. As we started out with a 500 Brunel armor, then worked on automotive sheet metal, now we're back to ultra hard 600 armor. We've actually been certified by the US Army. Um, the sheet on the right hand side is our actual sign off as of November 10th. And uh, our material, as best as we can tell, is 15% higher performing than the closest readily weldable competing armor. What I mean by that is, is high hard 500 Brunel is what the Army uses a tremendous amount of to weld up their vehicle hulls and, and other things, be it a guard shack or something else. Um, they do this because ultra hard 600 is very, very difficult, if not impossible to weld. You have to preheat to 350 degrees, use austenitic stainless steel welding rod and then post temper at 350 degrees to avoid a brittle weld zone. I don't just mean a, a weld that looks pretty. I mean, I'm talking about embrittlement that you investigate with hardness mapping. Well, what we've done is we've worked with University of Tennessee, um, Knoxville and Oak Ridge National Lab and gone through some trials and tribulations. And we have been able to get our ultra hard 600 with a rather simple welding process to have a non brittle heat affected zone. And what I mean by that is, is through the entire haze, the hardness is actually about 100 points Brunel lower than the ultra hard 600 is itself. So that's a good thing for non brittle failure. 
Um, as we've given an example of the, the weld on the left-hand side lower. Now, one thing we're doing beyond this is uh, we're actually doing a little bit more research because we believe we can take it a step further. And in our internal testing, we are actually stopping 30 caliber M2 armor piercing bullets with only a quarter inch thick flash armor. Now they are at 30 degree obliquity, but that's because that's what the US Army spec does say. Um, the 2771, I guess when you blow it up, it's a little bit overwritten, but that's 2771 feet per second, which is about the factory muzzle velocity of a 30 caliber armor piercing bullet. And as you can see the, the copper shatter to the left, there is no hole in our steel. And of course there was no backer plate or anything else. This was just a quarter inch plate. And we've done this multiple times. Um, as far as I know, there is no US production source for an ultra hard 600 class two that can stop armor piercing at a quarter inch thick. And in the world, there is no readily weldable ultra hard 600 either. So there's a lot of applications here for bulldozers, dump trucks, and I guess armor plate as well. Um, so now that we've got uh, a leading high hard 500 technology for armor and a leading 600 high ultra hard technology for armor, let's take a step back to automotive because after all this is lift and we're in Detroit, so let's talk about cars. If you compare paths to advanced high strength steel, um, looking on the right is a, a picture I've had for a while of a, a $400 million seven story tall continuous annealing furnace. And I guess in fairness, I've heard the prices are coming down, but we're still talking many hundreds of millions of dollars to build one of these seven story furnaces. When you consider that they can produce somewhere in the neighborhood of 400,000 tons per year, um, the cost is about a hundred, I'm sorry, is about a thousand dollars per ton of annual capacity. There's tremendously high tonnage out of a piece of equipment like this, but margins are a little bit tight. And that I know of, there's only a few of these in the United States, uh, one in Southern Ohio, and I think Middle has a couple in uh, Indiana. Don't, don't quote me on that, but I, I think there's three. Now, in comparison, um, I, I'd love to share a little bit more information and Ken with an NDA, but we have equipment patents currently being filed and under construction with our phase three SBIR grant from the Department of Energy, we're building a piece of equipment uh, it's costing us $1.3 million. In fairness, uh, three suppliers dropped their prices quite significantly to be able to participate with us, but um, probably you could get a brand new line for $2 million or less. Um, our equipment's got $100 per ton of capacity requirements, and this piece of equipment's going to be capable of 15 to 20,000 tons of flash per year. Now, somebody might say, my gosh, why do I only want 15 to 20,000 tons? Well, the, the easy answer back is, is because you can fit this piece of equipment in about a thousand square feet plus some support space. You can do it in a 5,000 square foot building with a big high-low or put in a crane if you'd like. And uh, you've got the opportunity for some significant revenue. Um, this machine should be able to generate 30 to $40 million, but at a 40% profit margin. Um, final assembly on this machine starts second quarter this year. Uh, I'm told it's actually going to be rolling steel, less the heat treating part by the end of this month in January. So um, practical applications, we need to meet the auto industry's need. It's, it's nice to talk about science, but what can you do with this material? Well, uh, these are some pictures of a part that uh, we tested a little while ago. Uh, so if you've met me, um, I usually carry around a briefcase of parts. This is one of my favorite parts to bring with me. So you know, hundreds of people have seen this one. Uh, we started out with a round tube about 140 millimeters long. We took that round tube and what we did with it is we formed it in a little stamping die to put the dimples in it and turn it into a rectangle. And then very unceremoniously and non-scientifically, we put it in a mechanical stamping press and smashed it. Now what's interesting is if you look at the inset circle, our material with 1225 megapascal yield, 1550 ultimate, and 45 to 48 Rockwell C is actually bending nearly like a sheet of paper without cracking. So those aren't perfect zero T bends, 
but they're pretty darn close. And uh, in a recent study by U.S. Steel, they found that the ability to bend is almost synonymous with the ability to absorb energy. It's a very good indicator. So we've got a very bendable material. Um, we also know that energy absorption is very good. Um, we're making cold stamped 1600 megapascal parts. And uh, as shown in the upper right, we've got a roof rail. This was a part for Hyundai Kia, as well as a, a B-pillar inner on the left and a floor reinforcement. These parts are all currently produced by hot stamping 1500 megapascal steel, but it's shown that we can cold stamp them, which is obviously a little bit less expensive. Uh, on the lower right inset is a, a fuel shield. We were actually able to reduce the, the mass of the current production part from three pounds down to 1.3 pounds. That's a 57% mass reduction and still pass baseline testing after seven days of work at an OEM test lab, testing dozens of different parts. So they had actually talked to us um, once we get in production about doing a just a 33% mass savings for um, this current shield at the major OEM. One thing that's very interesting is you don't need special heats of steel that cost a whole bunch of money. This substrate is actually melted by AK Steel. It's just their plain carbon 1020 steel, and we purchased it commercially out of Admiral Steel in Chicago. So there's nothing fancy here going on. Now, um, the next thing we've done is we actually took one of the corners of the uh, fuel shield in the lower right inside of the previous slide, and we actually stamped some two millimeter thick 1800 megapascals. And this is cold stampable 1800, a 1420 megapascal yield. It's only about eight and a half percent elongation, but it's got bendability to one and a half T which is pretty interesting. We didn't have to roll form it because roll forming, you can get tighter radiuses. This is actually cold stamping at 1800. So there, there's definitely some opportunities once we can get switched up from tw the current 1200 to the 1500 we'll be producing later this summer, we're already ready with 1800. In fact, it's one of the stated five-year goals of the Department of Energy in a recently published uh, agenda from the, the Advanced Manufacturing Office they would like to have a cold stampable 1800 by the year 2022. Well, we've got the science here and we'll have the production equipment funded by DOE within the next six months. Um, taking it a step further, because people are always concerned about corrosion, um, we've actually made a third gen stainless steel at 1800 megapascals, but very interestingly at 12% elongation. We used 13 chrome, which is uh, an inexpensive stainless if there is such a thing. It's 13 chrome, no basic nickel added. And uh, there's a lot of uses beyond automotive. The oil and gas industry, uh, BP in particular, had told me that they were the ones that you know, pioneered the usage and invented the 13 chrome. But the opportunity for cutlery, food storage, and much more. Now, if you think of per mass, the, the specific strength is two times that of 6061 aluminum and equaling that of the very best titanium 64 sta bar um, yet we've got more elongation so lots of opportunities and this tensile test uh, i could provide the full document but we do all our tensile testing at tissue group lab services so we do have a2la certification for what i do Another interesting point is the, the World Auto Steel banana curve, which I think everybody's seen a banana curve in one form or another. And what happens is you look at where the current third gen advanced high strength steels are. And of course, there is a, an ellipse to the right that's not shown where they talk about the future third gen high strength steels. Uh, well, flash bayonite at 1800 megapascals and 12% is up in the range. So I, I believe it might be fair to say that we've got the world's first you know, future third gen advanced high strength steel. We're just waiting to push this into full production once our 10 ton coil to coil flash processing line is running at Q2 this year. Um, performance, of course, we're all competing for market share in this lightweight world. And I think uh, the future vehicles are gonna be multi-material. Even uh, conferences I've been to, the the folks from the aluminum industry have spoken how steel is still going to be 50 to 60 percent of a vehicle's mass 10 years from now. So um, as we all compete, 
Um, we think that Flash has an upper edge on the other technologies out there currently be develop, being developed for steel. Um, over the last four years, almost well, from one year ago to five years ago, I should say, um, General Motors was the PI on uh, the ICME project funded by Department of Energy. Three OEMs, four steel mills, half a dozen universities, and some tier ones, and about $10 million spent and what they found is uh, they needed to add manganese to the steels to try and develop retained austenite. Unfortunately, um, on May 31st at a conference in Colorado, General Motors tech fellow Kurt Horvath wrote that it is becoming increasingly clear that a reevaluation re of general chemistry and processing strategies is needed for current and future retained austenite bearing steel designs. So while a lot of research has been put into generating retained austenite for formability, there's a little secret that that retained austenite, when you galvanize it, causes problems. Um, further, Horvath wrote that most challenges are currently considered manageable with the exception of the presence of liquid metal embrittlement in the resistant spot welds. So it might be interesting to have uh, five or seven percent manganese steel at 15 percent elongation, but if you can't uh, galvanize it and then spot weld it, it's going to be a problem. And right now they do kind of deal with uh, retained austenite in 1180 megapascal steels, but to get to 1500 in the elongation needed, they're going to need more manganese and more susceptibility to liquid metal embrittlement then. If this isn't the solution, what's next? Well, Flash is dealing in a $2 trillion metals industry, as we all are, and uh, this is a chart on specific strength. If you look at uh, the far left, um, second column in, you can talk about aluminum, and aluminum at 50 KSI um, divided by its 0.1 pounds per cubic inch has a specific strength of about 500. So when the, the Ford F-150 commercials come on and they talk about aluminum stronger than high strength steel, technically they're correct, but HSLA really isn't high strength, I don't think, by any stretch of the imagination anymore. Um, comparing to Martensite or Hot Stamp 1500, you move a little bit over, and now you've got the standard automotive grades. If you consider Flash 1600 or 1800, made from low-cost plain carbon steels, um, moving over one more step, you come to Titanium 64 um, STA bar, and uh, then you've got Flash 1900 and Flash 2100, megapascal strength, or our 500 Brunel and 600 Brunel armor made from simple off-the-shelf chrome moly steel. And the steel people I talk to sell, tell me it's important to point out that the, the ultra-hard 600 armor was actually melted over at Gallatin, which uh, is not uh, the absolute best place to make 4140 steel at. It's a good quality product, but it's not something that you would typically consider for heat treating based on their grain sizes. Yet we took that material and made it into something pretty darn interesting. Uh, forming limit curves are always important when you're doing simulations on can you even make the part. Um, this work was done by Hyundai and a gentleman by the name of Danny Schaeffler, who's highly respected in Metro Detroit for making FLDs. The red curve shows the FLD for Martin Site 1500, the green curve for Flash 1500, and the yellow curve for DP1000. So even though Flash's total elongation is similar to M1500, the local formability and the biaxial formability actually make Flash form just as well as a DP1000. That's pretty interesting. So we had to put this to the test working with auto OEMs, and we have actually gone out and formed parts that in the past had been limited to DP780 or DP980, yet we're cold stamping them in prototype tools with Flash 1500 and Flash 1600. Uh, we spoke about energy absorption a little bit before when I showed you that crush can. This is also some data that Hyundai Kia was kind enough to allow us to share. And in the chart on the left, we talk about resisting force on the vertical axis and wall thickness on the horizontal axis. Um, we have some examples of some curves plotted because uh, Hyundai Kia was kind enough to test tubing diameters from 25 to 32 millimeters as signified by FB 25 millimeter up to FB 32 millimeter, but also in wall thicknesses from 1.6 to 3.0 millimeters. 
Um, I like to look at this resisting force chart at the wall thickness of 2.4 millimeters because there's a nice abundance of data. And you can see that the flash bayonite 32 millimeters has about 15% higher resisting force at the same diameter and same wall thickness as the boron 32 millimeters. If you go over to the right hand side, what happens is uh, similar at 2.4 millimeters, looking at the energy absorb absorbed situation, the flash bayonite actually has about 20 to 25% higher energy absorption, same diameter, same wall thickness. Now, some people have said, well, of course it does. You're working with 4130 alloy steel. Boron steels are only typically you know, 0.22 to 0.25. And you know, my, my comeback to that statement is, is that flash bayonite has the ability to, let's say, hold its carbon better than a boron steel does without becoming brittle. What I mean by that is, is when flash bayonite tubes are impacted and bend, the circle turns into an oval for quite some distance. Even at a, a three foot tube bent for eight inches of deflection or 200 millimeters of deflection is still an oval. Now, if you compare a boron tube, usually after about 80 millimeters or three and a half inches of deflection, it's already collapsed like a drinking straw and really isn't even working anymore. So um, yes, flash bayonite does have a little bit more carbon for this test result here, but my goodness, if, if flash can hold its carbon and weld nicely, what does carbon really matter? Um, sustainability, something that's kind of important. You know, we've got plain carbon steel, minimal capex, high performance and some pretty good profit. Stronger, highly bendable energy absorbing steel leads to safer cars, which I don't think anybody would argue is a good idea. It's a great idea. Um, lighter cars, higher fuel efficiency, whether it's ice or electric, we want lighter cars. Um, and also we think flash is just the next step in the life cycle of steel, which happens to be the most recycled product on earth. Well, how easy is this to apply in a lot of places? Um, sometimes technology gets applied in the laboratory, and as I know Joe mentioned, you don't want it to sit on a shelf. You want this to go places. Well, how do you get it to go places? You test out different things. We took nine heats of steel from five different steel mills. The carbon content ranged from 0.18 to 0.23 within the specifications of the 1020 um, chemistry. Some was hot rolled, some was cold rolled, some was sheet that was heated from both, heated and cooled from both sides, while others was tubing that was only heated and quenched from the outside of the tube, just because that's where your apparatus can, you know, attack the steel from. And then we also did thin and thick wall. Now, what was interesting is prior to flash processing, you could take those nine heats of steel do EVSD and look at everything microscopically and you could put them into their own discrete bin so that if somebody randomly grabbed a piece and handed it to you, you would be able to analyze it and put it in its own bin. Well, after flash processing, the microstructure was essentially standardized and they were indistinguishable from each other. So you couldn't tell if it was 1018 or 1023, 0.23 carbon if it was hot rolled or cold rolled, or if it came from a tube or a sheet, the flash processing from all these different mills actually makes everything equalized out, giving the same product. So now all of this, the distinguishing characteristics of a steel mill, and one mill makes a better this, or one mill makes a better that, flash processing makes them all the same. And we've actually gone and, uh, hold on. Sorry, that was a phone that shouldn't have been ringing in my office. Um, so anyhow, we've made it all indistinguishable and we have taken steels from, uh, from different parts around the world as well. As part of our Department of Energy group uh, work, we have gotten steels from Europe and uh, Southeast Asia for processing. Okay, um, kind of wrapping it up, I'd just like to tell everybody thank you for paying attention and apologize for that phone jumping in in the last 30 seconds. And, uh, and considering practicality, you know, flash right now is automotive and it's armor plate. But just imagine if you made shipping containers that weighed 4,000 pounds or that weighed 8,000 pounds now only weigh 4,000 pounds. Um, 
if you made rebar with flash technology, and also the thought of I-beams, because this is just a variant of induction heating, and we could make a coil for that. Um, as far as performance goes, um, we've got a record-setting armor technology, and uh, we're proving 20 to 50% mass savings in automotive stampings. Uh, for marketability, um, we're actually, we cre flash created the field of ultra fast heating. And there's actually masters and PhD thesis out there from people I haven't even met that talk about this technology because of its opportunity to reduce mass and cost in better components. Um, sustainability, increased safety, fuel efficiency, lower steel mill emissions. There's, there's much opportunity here. Steel is used for so many things. Um, and there's an opportunity for profit because of uh, the low capex and low input material, low cost input material. Um, we think that flash is exactly what many billions of dollars in steel research has sought for decades, but this is all with the familiarity of steel. Um, there's no exotic changeovers. Um, thank you for your time. And Joe, I can turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Uh... Gary, uh, very good presentation. I hope uh, folks understand now, uh, you know why 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 uh, Flash Bayonite has been a longtime uh, Lyft member. And Gary is telling the truth when he says uh, he does carry his satchel of parts around. I saw him just this morning with uh, with a uh, with his uh, with his satchel of parts uh, to show off. So, um, remember, a reminder: if there are questions, please uh, please do use your uh, chat function and address them to uh, the organizer, and then we can. Uh, uh, we can shoot them over to Gary. Um, in the meantime, I want to thank everyone for uh, for joining us again. Uh, these webinars are uh, are recorded and then uh, and then posted on the Lyft website at lyft.technology/liftoff. Uh, you can revisit this one or you can go back and and uh, and and review some of the other ones uh, that we've had them in the past. Or you can check out uh, some of the upcoming um, webinars that we have. Uh, and don't uh, forget to check in each month to. Uh, to register for uh, for each month uh, each month's conversation as they uh, as they come up. I know we're getting close to the uh, to the top of the hour, so I don't want to keep uh, folks too long. I want to be respectful of uh, of folks' times. Um, Gary, is there a uh, is there a contact where we could get a hold of you? Is there an email address or a website that folks should know about so they can get a hold of you with any questions in the future? Uh, there is a website, flashbayonite.com. Um, and there is a you know a contact you know button there to connect with us, and that comes directly to my desk. So um, I, I usually try to respond within a few hours as, soon as I see things. So uh, actually traveling tomorrow, so that'll be an exception. But usually I do you know respond pretty quickly because I'm excited to talk to people. Well, fantastic. We appreciate that. I don't see too many questions uh, coming in. So uh, and we are getting close to the top of the hour. So with that, I will thank everyone for. Uh, for joining us today, Gary, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to speak to us about Flash Bayonite and all the fun, uh, the the cool stuff you have going on there with the uh, with the armor and and the high strength steels. So please uh, please stay tuned uh, at Lift Technology for future webinars and get in contact with Gary at FlashBayonite.com with any questions. Until next time, uh, thank you very much. Thank you everyone very much for joining, and uh, we'll see you in February.